So in this video, I solved the problem that I have with cobbled, goblin, and other small creature lairs in D&D, which is basically, most of us use cave terrain that is quite large. The standard size corridor is about 10 to 15 feet, double to triple what even an average human needs, and we do that for a reason. But cobbles and such are tiny little industrious buggers who carve warrens of tight tunnels less than five feet wide that most medium creatures have to squeeze to navigate. So I made some additions to my existing modular tiles. I also included a ton of traps and ambush points. By the end of this, your players will fear the nest of cobbles like the little dragons they are. You know, take candle. Welcome to the archive. My name's Matt. To get started, I tried a ton of different variations to show these tiny winding tunnels, but ended up settling on these thin ragged corridors with rounded ends and curves for connecting, which I managed to get surprisingly stable for minis using, surprising nobody, magnets. I cut these shapes from half inch thick XPS foam, mostly using my hot wire. I found it easier to cut off small chunks at a time. That way I could pause and think about what shape I wanted to cut from the next bit. I also found that carving the rough shape I wanted with a pencil slightly wider than I was going to actually cut it helped too. I used a knife to cut away the underside a bit as well, to remove the hot wire pattern and to make it more easily overlooked. I'll be saying why in a bit. By the end, these were the basic shapes I ended up creating. To make them nice and stable, I used cheap magnetic sheet to lay out underneath wherever I was going to be using these pieces. You can find links for these in the equipment list in the description, and anything you buy through Amazon links on that list helps support the channel for free. To get the strips to stick to these, I melted a space for and glued in two large magnets to each piece. I used magnets near, but not at the end of each piece, about an inch from the tip, so to speak, facing north side to the top. This makes sure they don't interfere with each other when placed nearby. Now that was in place, I added texture using the caveman technique I've shown before, pushing gently this time the piece into a rock with an interesting texture. Once done, I added some additional connections by cutting a slit down the middle and pushing in a few uncoiled paper clips, just deep enough to hide them. These are what allow minis to magnetically attach to the tunnels using the exact same system that I show in the stair blocks video. Remember, all these magnets are optional. You can just make them heavy by putting rivets in the bottom and be careful. The slit itself I covered up once this was done with some milliput smoothed on with a damp finger and then given texture using a damp piece of foam. Honestly, I later found that using a small amount of modeling compound was a lot better, so I just advise using that. Once I let this dry overnight, it was pretty much good to paint, which I did in the same way as my other cave tiles, including super gluing down some patches of arid earth sand and adding some of my grout and dirt mix to random patches afterwards. And yes, that is important, or the super glue will activate too quickly and frost over. The one exception to this was I painted the sides black. Why, you ask? Basically, Black Magic Craft made popular the idea of painting the sides of tiles to represent the walls that you can't see. This is usually pretty relevant for my builds because I use walls. However, on these, I kept the walls off because they simply wouldn't fit. But on a piece like this, I personally prefer the side to blend away and be ignored. Otherwise, it feels more like a thin bridge and less like an enclosed cramped corridor. Personal preference, season to taste. These basic tiles were pretty easy. The slopes were a little bit harder to figure out, but pretty straightforward once I got it down. I found I could make two from one piece of foam here by measuring a half inch on each side opposite each other and then drawing and cutting a sloping line between the two. I cut these from one inch thick foam, but if you don't have access to that, you could just cut two half inch pieces and stack them together. This would also give you the slit for the path, which I'll be cutting anyway when I get to that point. Once I had that, I cut the edges using the hot wire, which is really a lot easier than using a knife for this bit, though it is still possible to do with a knife with perseverance. I also cut an arch out of the bottom. This lets me use it over other tunnels and make caves even more windy in 3D. On top of that, I made some new three inch stacking blocks too from cheap polystyrene with magnetic sheet cut for the top. I also added arches to a few of these, giving the tunnels even more flexibility to wind over others. Once I had the basic slope and pattern, I cut the slit, added paper clips, added magnets underneath, textured, puttied and painted. And that's pretty much it. Something I realized while talking to a patron who has a Badges and Burrows game running is you can pretty much use these tunnels as animal burrows, just by texturing them with dirt and grout instead of like caves. I also made some new mountain block variants that can be used as sneaky rooms with a crack through which cobbles can shoot unwary intruders. I made one to sit in or on a wall, one to extend over the corridor so that cobbles can drop things, 
and one more that's more of a doorway into the smaller tunnels. Combine the three and you can have a main tunnel with ambush room offshoots, all with a cobbled sized access route. To make the wall crack room, I made it from some pieces of one inch and half inch foam, all glued together with hot glue at the end. The idea here is that the sides of the room will rarely be exposed, so that's where most of the joints are. The floor is half an inch high, so it lines up with cave floor tiles or tunnel tiles used next to it. Before gluing them together, I cut the side walls at an angle with a knife so they were easier to see into. I measured a half inch up from the bottom, sloping up to the top, drew lines and cut chunks out, leaving some rough rocky shapes. I did a similar thing to the front wall. I lined up the side walls against one half of the front and used them as a template to cut a chunk out with an X-Acto knife at an angle. I then cut a crack out of the front half to line up and hot glued them together. I textured them all over with the caveman technique as well and then glued everything left together. I sealed up the gaps on one of these with Milliput and another one with Modeling Compound. The Modeling Compound is a way better choice for this job. It lacks the durability of the Milliput but is far more naturally textured. Oh, and after painting, I added some arid earth and grout, just like the tunnels. The overhanging block I made in pretty much the same way, but with only two walls, which can be connected either to a mountain block or to another one of these overhanging blocks using magnets or cocktail sticks to help secure it to one wall representing a dead end, or even on both sides as a corridor bridge. This also leaves it as a separate three inch piece you can place on top of a cheap arched stacking block from earlier to use with the smaller tunnels where full blocks wouldn't fit. Oh, and it has a hole in the floor, obviously. Finally, there's the tunnel entrance block, which is basically the same as the piece with the crack in the wall, except the crack is wider and more like a tunnel entrance. I cut the hole deep and wide enough to fit a cobbled size creature, making sure that the bottom was wide enough for a base to fit on. I cut it flat about a half inch from the bottom so that it also lines up with floor and tunnel tiles. This means I can use it as a tunnel leading to a vantage point for cobbles to shoot from. You can also do this with stone walls by cutting out a chunk of the stone wall half an inch up. This way you can have tunnels that burrow into and throughout buildings and dungeons. With that, you've got a very flexible set of cave tunnels that are also stable and stack magnetically for storage. And if you are a new DM, it's worth remembering that medium creatures that squeeze into a smaller space get disadvantage on their attack rolls, disadvantage on dexterity saves, they move at half speed, and smaller creatures get advantage to attack them. So the tunnel itself is kind of a trap in its own right. Right, here's a nice gallery of all the finished pieces in action while I thank my generous patrons, without whom these videos would not get made. That support is absolutely crucial. Without enough patrons in the long run, I quite simply couldn't afford to continue. So thank you so much to everybody who helps out. There's also a bunch of benefits to being a patron because I like to say thank you, including templates, printables, bonus videos, live streams, and polls on what exactly I make next. So if any of that sounds good, please check it out. So that's tunnels done, but what about traps? Well, in Volos, a ton of things are talked about, but a few stand out. First, let's do the easy ones. Cave-ins and rock falls make both great traps and great DM tools to create obstacles, even if it's just to give the players something to think about while you catch up with their latest changing plans. To make these for narrow tunnels and normal tiles, I wanted pretty much the same thing, a flat edge on the side that would either line up with a wall or visually imply that there was one there in the case of the tunnel. To do this, I used pretty much the same technique for both with different sized rocks. I made a foam frame of the right width and added parchment paper to the bottom and sides. I then dumped down a mix of various sized stones of similar color to my cave tiles and layered them on, letting them fall naturally and form a wall as they naturally would. This way it looks far less like they're all held up by glue, even though they are. To form a strong connection, I dribbled on some liquid super glue across the whole piece and soaked up any excess of it with some kitchen roll. Once dry, I cut it off, cut away any excess glue from the edges with a knife, and gave it a quick spray of matte varnish to remove the sheen. And that was it. A nice, realistic looking cave-in or rockfall trap. Easy. The other easy trap is one specific to small creatures, and also gives some nice scatter terrain. In Volos, it says cobbles often have low-lying safety ropes near dangerous faults. Small enough to protect cobbles, but just the right height to trip larger humanoids. To make these easier to make, I cut cocktail sticks to three quarters of an inch long and carved some chunks off to make them look like rough metal, before super gluing them upright to some parchment paper. Once dry, I scattered on some small rocks at the bottom to add weight, sealing them in place with Zap Liquid Superglue. 
I found it was easier to do this way because it keeps the post nice and straight and upright, which makes it easier to push the rocks into place and drip the glue on without knocking the post over. Once done, I just cut away the paper from the bottom with a knife. For the rope, I unthreaded some string and stained it with army paint a soft tone thinned two to one with water before squeezing it with kitchen roll to remove the excess. I wrapped them around the spikes as rope near the top. The spikes I painted with GW Ironbreaker with a strong tone wash. This gave me a chance to test out some AK enamel rust effects I'd picked up though, which I thought were crap until I actually looked up how to use them. If you do get these, you're meant to apply them and then poke the edges around with a damp brush. This not only gives a nicer, rougher texture than you get just by applying, it also weathers it at the edge in a natural way, rather than the harsh, sharp curves you get by applying it like paint alone. I'm not totally confident with this rust effect yet, but I am going to keep experimenting with it and feed back to you guys as I learn more. I made these about six inches long and with about three spikes per piece, so they fit and bend nicely around the edges of my mountain block tiles. Trips and traps aside, I also wanted some new bridges to use. One was pretty straightforward and was similar to the cave bridge that I showed in the cavern video. The main difference being it was a lot thinner while still being stable for minis. To do this, I added some small magnets north side up down the middle so minis could be securely attached without worrying about them dropping off. I did this in pretty much the same way as I did for the tunnels earlier, but I used modeling compound to seal it this time and honestly found it a lot easier to hide. For connections at the edges, I added some strong magnets on each side to line up with the magnets in floor tiles. This makes it easier to connect and compatible with any I make in future without the card tab slots, though you could just add card tab slots if that's more your thing. It can also be connected to magnetized mountain blocks if you're a patron and you've had time to play with that optional video. This thinner, more perilous. We were in the nick of time, you were in great peril. I did think I was. Yes, you were, you were in terrible peril. Ahem. <clears throat> more perilous bridge gives you plenty of opportunities to ambush players in a rather unfortunate and easy to fall to their doom kind of environment, and makes cobbles a lot more dangerous. Speaking of dangerous cobbles, this last bridge is also a trap. Because of course it is. Probably the most dastardly trap in Volos, to be honest, because it's just so unassuming. I mean, it's just a bridge. It can totally hold our weight, right? This bridge is a bit more complicated to make, but is also a lot more flexible. It can go across at various distances, but also up, down, and even across at an angle with the right bits, but I'll get to that in a future video. All of this hangs off the connection pieces, which attach neatly to a floor tile with, say it with me now, magnets. Strong 6 by 4 millimeter ones again, this time super glued into holes cut into the back of two pieces of balsa dowel. All of this balsa dowel I heavily wire brushed and pulled bits out of to make it more weathered than usual. I think this is a much better method than just cutting the wood that using balsa allows you to do because it's weaker. It gives a much more realistic ragged look. I stained it before gluing, but after cutting all of the slots that I needed, using the same black wash that I use for caves and mountain blocks. I then built the framework for the bridge around these planks. I added two pieces of one eighth of an inch balsa dowel to the back of the planks, cutting holes for them and sealing them in place with super glue. On top of these pieces of dowel, I wrapped some thin stained string around using gel super glue. Not liquid super glue, right? That's this stuff, not this stuff. Two. Seal it. And then gel super glued a two millimeter by two millimeter magnet on the side and wrap that with string and gel super glue again to hide it, cutting off the excess with a knife. Finally, I added two other small magnets, three millimeter by two millimeter ones this time, to either side of the planks at the front, lined up at the edge with the wood pieces. These are what'll hold the bridge intact, but let it move and be modular all at the same time. For the bridge pieces themselves, I made some two and a half inches long, which works well for a single three inch length bridge crossing a single tile. I also made some extra three and a quarter inch long pieces so I could extend the bridge much further if I wanted to, which allows it to dip more as it gets bigger. I started by staining a bunch of balsa planks in the same way as the end pieces, before gel super gluing them to two lengths of string, one inch apart, stained with watered down soft tone wash before weaving some string strands around the outer edges of the planks for some extra detail. I also added a small magnet beneath every few planks, which really helps keep the models placed on the bridge safe. For the connections, I added some three millimeter magnets again, again with the north on the right and the south on the left when looking at them. I super glued these under the edge planks, hidden at the sides behind the string. You could stop here, 
but I wanted handrails for my rope bridge. Remember, the idea is that the weight snaps the bridge. The cobbles don't need to knock them off. To achieve this, I added two more pieces of string for each side, with tiny 2mm by 2mm magnets super glued on the ends, with more thin strands wrapped on to hide the glue. These just connect to the magnets on the post at each end. I made two for each bridge piece, the same length as the piece, plus an extra sixteenth of an inch for flexibility. And that's it. Another perilous... Oh, let me have just a little bit of peril. No, doesn't help. Ahem. <clears throat> bridge completed. Once done, these bridge pieces will snap to each other and the edge pieces at any distance or angle. Seriously, you could get a small army of plastic minis on this long bridge and it'd be fine. They're also nice and easy to simulate falling bridges with, and allow you to attach minis to dangling bridges, showing characters clinging on for dear life or climbing. Please subscribe, like, comment and share, and until next time, I'll be in the archive.